This video is about a LED replacement for fluorescent tubes and it's actually quite a long tube this one, it's a four foot tube um, and it's the T8 size. T8 meaning uh, eight eighths of an inch, so it's approximately one inch diameter and it's the type of, uh, it's a very common type, look at the big dent here, that's something I'll, I'll talk about afterwards, it's the smallest of the dents. Uh, but it's the type of uh, fluorescent uh, replacement that has the LEDs projecting the light out one side and then the back is basically just an aluminium channel. This one's interesting because it's also got the radar detector built in. And I thought this was just going to turn it on and off, but it doesn't. It actually uh, changes intensity from uh, 19 watt power output when it's on to when it's not detec detecting disturbances, it goes down to 3.5. It's also worth mentioning that this is a, a tube that I just did an experiment with. I used another radar lamp in the same room. I had to put a little bit of black tape over its light sensor because this one doesn't uh, doesn't have a light sensor. It's purely uh, designed to be either at low level or high level. But uh, this one, I put it in the same room and uh, they did not interfere with each other. But it would be interesting to try a set of maybe three of these lamps identical from the same batch to see if the closer frequencies will, will react. Um, but certainly these two operated independently and didn't interact, which is useful to know. So let's uh, look at the concept of wiring these things up because it's not as simple as just stick it in your fluorescent fitting. There are some you can stick in a fluorescent fitting, but there are others that have to re require that the fluorescent fitting is rewired. So normally in a fluorescent fitting, You've got the live come in, and it goes through a fuse. This is handy because that's what uh, gets pulled when people are making these modifications. So hopefully it is actually uh, got an active fuse. Uh, then it goes through a choke or ballast or inductor to limit the current. Or uh, in modern fittings, it will actually go through an electronic driver. But uh, the gist is that uh, that then goes down to the tube itself. And the tube has two pins at each end and a little heated cathode inside and then a starter, which uh, basically the starter just shunts momentarily. I did a video about these. Uh, everything you wanted to know about fluorescent tubes, was it? I can't remember what it was called. But anyway, the gist is the current is limited by this choke, this inductor, and the uh, heated electrodes at the end lower the operating voltage of the tube, which means it's much easier to operate at mains voltage. However, to actually adapt these fittings for um, these LED lamps, you have to get rid of the choke. And you have to instead, and the starter, and you have to instead, in the older tubes, you have to take the live to one end and the neutral to the other. And uh, the modern uh, tubes, apparently in some countries they are making that illegal to have tubes that have the live at one end and the neutral at the other because people have been going up to change them, they've been poking the new tube into the live fitting and then because it is, the circuit is right through to the other end, they've been getting electric shocks off the other end. Well, here's a bit of news to those guys or whoever made the rule up that they should ban them for this reason. <laughs> You should never hold the end of a fluorescent tube, the other end, if you're poking the other end into live connection because the gas in here can ionise. All it takes is the right electrostatic conditions and the tube could potentially ignite and you could get an electric shock through that in, of enough magnitude to knock you off steps. I just thought I'd mention that. So what's been happening is that uh, you've been getting uh, companies that have been going around and uh, they've been... It's basically sales motivated companies that, that go around offices, encourage them to change these tubes and they've been sending gangs of labourers who have just been shown barely enough to reduce the risk of them being electrocuted and they go in and they pull the fuse and the light and then they butcher all the wiring and leave it in an unknown state. And at that point you cannot use an ordinary fluorescent tube in that fitting. It's actually, in some instances, it could be dangerous because if they've just taken the starter out and they've wired out the ballast, it could actually make this tube actually pass an awful lot of current with unknown results. So, um, back to the subject in hand though. The two ways of connecting these tubes, they've got two pins in the end. In the case of this one, they're just linked internally and you apply live to one end, neutral to the other. With the newer tubes, the safer tubes, uh, you have live and neutral going at one end, and I'm not sure. I'm guessing the pins are just not connected to the other end, but that means that 
it's only going to work one way around the fitting unless the fitting has uh, both the sockets are live and neutral at both ends so the, the fitting works in either way around because you couldn't just loop it through inside the tube because that would then open up the risk of getting a shock off the end again. Yeah, it's not straightforward. But uh, the gist of it is you've got these tubes being put into your uh, office and you're going, oh, wow, low energy lighting and all the labourers depart. And then you're thinking, well, actually, it's low energy because it's dimmer and it's very grey looking. And one month later, you're thinking, I can't even read anything anymore because these have reduced in brightness so much. And you're screwed because, uh, well, you can't put the original tubes back. You're going to have to get more LED tubes and it's all going to happen again. It's all just been a bit sad. But anyway, I digress. Um, here is the other end of that tube with a huge dent. It's really whacked. It's really been bent. It is physically bent. The tube is a different shape. This doesn't work with glass tubes. They tend to make a loud pop noise and all the sort of glass and phosphor comes out of them. But let's take the end off. This is the non-active end. So let's see what's inside. I'm going to have to use a smaller screwdriver here. So it's got this little cover over the end, over the end pins, just for packaging. So it doesn't burst out the packaging in excitement. And if I take these two screws out, The end comes off showing that one connection splodged on and you can see at that point that the fitting is the normal construction. It's this aluminium channel with the slot for the circuit board that holds it in place. It's a loose circuit board, it's not got heat sink compound or anything, it's physically just slid up the end like so many of these are. And then it's got this uh, plastic channel that's just put over the top uh, of the LEDs. So you can see the circuit board here. Now here's the thing. this metal case. This housing is a kind of heat sink, but the circuit board, these LEDs may be powered by a buck regulator, which is kind of reference to the mains. And as such, uh, there's a tolerance. There's a, you know, the only thing that's actually separating the sort of potentially the live connections in here is this tiny gap to this lip on this metal housing. And then you look at where it's been dented here and you think that's just pushed that in. Uh, and it could potentially have scraped the uh, the solder resist, the actual white coating on the circuit board. So I wouldn't say that I'd be confident that, you know, if you've got one of these that's been slightly dented or even, I bet there's some floating about in normal use, that this metal panel is actually potentially live uh, and could deliver a shock. It's just something you have to keep in mind. So let's go to the other end now, because the other end is promising to be much more exciting. The other end has the sensor in it, so let's pull that little cap off. I will say I was quite impressed by the fact that uh, it's quite a nice level of light it puts out at the 19 watts. Its power factor is exemplary at 9.5, should I say. The closer to one the better. And uh, it's when it cuts down to the lower level it's 3.5 watts but still quite bright. So here's a little circuit board in here, a little module. It's the Doppler module. It's not coming out. Right, okay, I'm going to have to get a pair of pliers into this. Metal pliers, they're the best thing for sticking into the end of electrical things. Oh, come out. Right, there we go. That's small. So this is three connections. I wonder if it's getting... I would guess that it's low voltage, but I don't know for sure without actually checking this. And it'll have the positive negative, it'll have the signal back. Now, it's interesting to note there is a channel in here, a slot to hold this, but uh, this was actually just stuffed in sideways. It wasn't actually in the correct slot. So let's unplug this. Let's not, because it's got glue in it. Let's get the glue off and then unplug it. That's better. Neat little module. It's got the two circuit board arrangement, it's got the Doppler detection circuitry on here, and then it's got what looks like the BIS chip inside. BISS0001, going by the pin, pin count. I can also see what looks like a voltage regulator, and the rest will probably... I would guess this is going to operate at about 5 to 12 volts. So let's uh, see what else is in here. To open this further... I'm going to have to 
Um, take some more screws out, apparently. The aluminium extrusion also acts as the main frame for everything going together. It's this, these screws are tapped into channels in it. I know people are going to say, I wanted to see it lit. Uh, that's why the picture and the thumbnail is me holding it. Oh, here's the... Oh, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to remove the wire at the other end. Hold on. Yeah, I'm going to have to remove this wire before I can get that out. Am I going to regret this? I can always wrap sticky tape round it afterwards. ka -ching. Job done. Right. Let's pull this out. Oh, I should also say that this uh, this strip should slide out, but it's so dinged at the other end it's not going to go anywhere. I may have to cut this. Okay. Snip, snip. Uh, yeah, I should say that these were being sold suspiciously cheaply on eBay. Like there was something wrong with the listing. Like it had been listed incorrectly, or they were trying to get rid of the old stock uh, for the new ones that are the safer just fed, fed from one end. So is this going to come out or is this glued? It's glued at the ends, but I think we can, I think we can open that with a suitable screwdriver to burst the glue. There we go. Right. So, what have we got? We've got the mains coming in and going to this end. It's going through a bridge rectifier, but it's not being smoothed, and that would suggest this is going... I'm going to get a shock off this at some point. It's going to have capacitors charged up. Oh, look at that. It's a little buck regulatory type chip. But very minimalist. What is that big soldiery splodge? What? Is that a repair? Yes, yeah, someone has a uh, solder. There are two components in here with huge. They're surface mount components that get huge splodgy tails off them. <coughs> so this component here is a CS2N65. CS2N65. I'll note that down. CS2N65. But there is <coughs> also. A little dinky component here. Which is not terribly readable, unfortunately. It's got numbers on it, but they're not overly clear. It looks like 11E6 054. But that may be. It may be this is a FET, and this is a little switch mode chip. That's a wild guess. And I'm guessing it's going to be a buck regulator, but I could be wrong. There's an opto-isolator on this side, which is signalling back. Is that for current feedback, or is that actually to do with this circuitry here? Um. I wonder what the I wonder what the voltage across the output is. I may have to wire this up and uh, have a wee play with it lying out all over the place where I can get electrocuted. Yes, I'm going to have to do some experiments. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, I had a look on the internet. I couldn't really identify the numbers. It was a bit. It's, it's an odd scatter of numbers that didn't make sense. Didn't show up much. It doesn't really matter. I know it's probably a six pin buck regulator control chip, and this is probably the FET associated with the MOSFET to actually switch the inductor. It is definitely a buck regulator if I take the meter and I stick it on the negative output to the LEDs and then stick it over to the rectifier, there is direct connection through. So there's no isolation through this. It's not got an isolation transformer in it. And if you're ever messing about with one of these or you've got one that's got a major dent or bend in it, then treat the metal work potentially as live and certainly all these LEDs are referenced to the mains. After it's been uh, current limited by the buck regulator, there is a smoothing capacitor across it which is connected directly to the LEDs. 
so uh, that provides a fairly good ripple-free performance. It was quite nice light. <coughs> Uh, the LEDs are wired in series circuits of 24 and then there's a parallel bus of connections along either side which is very close, really close, like sub-millimeter uh, to the metal channel that supports it. So that's a bit squirmy actually, but it seems quite common. As I say, I, I wouldn't trust these metal housings as I think there's a risk that there, there's no proper separation that's going to guarantee that just a splash of solder or, you know, a faulty circuit board or a dent bending it in could potentially make this metal frame live enough to give you a shock. The output circuitry uh, is also, I mean, it caps off, I'll show you the voltages in fact. The buck regulator drops the supply to the LEDs. The LEDs themselves will clamp the voltage down to about, well, let's turn it on. Clamp the voltage down to about, get the meter in your shot, make sure I don't touch anything because it's all live. Uh, these LEDs are lit now, um, hold on, I'll just nudge this in a wee bit just so you can see. They're lit but uh, not the first 24 because I've burst it. Uh, I was trying to hook the circuit board out with my finger and I think I damaged one of the LEDs at the end, but that's okay. Uh, so the voltage across the LED bus is 80 volts. And uh, when it's dimmed down, that will drop slightly because the LEDs tend to increase the forward voltage as the current increase is raised through them. There is, to derive the power for the little sensor, because it's, the sensor is very low current, there's a couple of resistors uh, feeding a voltage regulator here, which uh, all the voltage regulator says in it is Y1. But it says VR next to it, and if I measure the voltage on this little unit, he says, precariously probing about because this thing is potentially, it is referenced. Even though it's low voltage, it's referenced to the mains. Uh, so I'm just going to be careful here. Don't want 240 volt surprises. And the voltage is, oh, 9 volts that's feeding this module. And then it will be regulated down further on probably to about 5 volts uh, or 3 volts with the onboard regulator. And it actually controls a control pin, which uh, if I bridge that to negative. Oh, hold on, I'll bring this in. So you can see, if you watch the LEDs at the end here, if I bridge the control pin to negative, you'll see the dim down. And what's actually happening there is the control signal is going back and it's uh, turning on a transistor, which is turning on an opto isolator, and the opto isolator then feeds over to the control side. And I'm not sure if it's just a control signal or it's actually just putting in another uh, resistor um, across in parallel or bridging out a resistor maybe uh, in the feedback circuit uh, but I'd guess it might be a dedicated control input or it might just be uh, adjusting the feedback components but um, it's an interesting design there is a little fuse in it and it's notable that uh, if you look at the wires they have identified the wires the ones that are sort of tinned are going to the live side and the ones that are copper are going to the neutral. I'm not sure the point of that because the thing can go in either way round effectively. But it's an interesting little circuit. Um, it's a neat light. I, I wonder why, I wonder if it was an accident they were being sold off at literally a few pounds each, including shipping for a four foot light. Uh, I wonder if that was an accident in the listing or if uh, they were just trying to get rid of them for some reason. But uh, well worth uh, opening up and taking to bits. So uh, just to finish with, I'm just going to bring this up. I don't think it's going to hold a charge. And you can have a, a look at the... I will just take the risk and handle both ends. Probably get a wallop off this at some point. Uh, but there we go. It's uh, got the capacitor. It's got the rectifier. Uh, it's got another capacitor just for filtering. Then it's got the driver circuit. The smoothing uh, for the output LEDs. The local uh, resistive dropper. The regulator the actual active sensing circuitry, which is a little Doppler circuit, and then the opto isolator that then uh, controls back to the other side. So it's a, a neat enough design, and it works very well. It works extremely well. Uh, once, uh, when I first tried this, it was a really stormy day outside, and it just kept triggering. And uh, it may have also been the fact that I was moving very slightly, because this is extraordinarily sensitive. Th these things, uh, if you just 
lean forward. You not actually walk forward, just lean forward slightly the detector and trigger it. So it's very impressive. But uh, yes, uh, it's it's a neat enough light. It, it looks good, puts out plenty of light. I don't know how long it would last particularly. Uh, it certainly doesn't last long when I open it and mess around. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting design. It, it seems reasonable enough.